Hey guys, I'm Joe, and today I'm here to finally start the series of reviews that I have been waiting to do for a while, my series of Spider-Man movie reviews, leading up to Spider-Man Homecoming later this year. So let's start off with Spider-Man 2002. And in case you haven't seen this movie by now, we're gonna go into spoilers, so you've been warned. Now you're probably wondering, Joe, didn't you review this already, like three years ago? Yes, I have. But it's an older video, I don't like the way it looked, and I felt like there was more to say about the movie. And at the time, I was still starting out on my channel, and I didn't really put a whole ton of effort into my reviews back then, or at least I feel like I didn't at that time. But in a way, it's like a blessing in disguise, if, I guess if you want to call it. Because I feel like my abilities as a reviewer have grown a little bit in the last couple of years, so I feel like I can go a little more in depth with Spider-Man at this point, and give you my thoughts on each of the movies as we go on throughout the next coming months. Now, for those of you who are new to my channel, I I wasn't really familiar with the character of Spider-Man before I saw this movie. In fact, I wasn't really into superheroes in general. But my dad took me to see this movie about a month after it came out. I was about 12 years old when this movie came out. This movie was huge. It was like the highest grossing weekend of all time. It just in one weekend alone, like over $100 million or something like that. And even with the critics, if you go back and read the critical reviews for this movie when it came out, they are over the top positive. People loved this movie when it came out. And it's really kind of amazing, no pun intended there, to think about how successful this movie was when nobody really thought it was going to be, even though it was Spider-Man. Because today, we have movies like Guardians of the Galaxy, X-Men Days of Future Past, Captain America, Iron Man, and back then in the early 2000s, movies like that were unheard of. I mean, we had the Superman movies, we had the Batman movies, and we had the first X-Men by Brian Singer. But even though the first X-Men by Brian Singer was good, it was more of like a door opener for the comic book movie genre. Spider-Man came along two years later, and it skyrocketed to even greater heights. So when my dad took me to see this movie a month or so after it came out, I wasn't really sure what to expect. But the moment that musical score by Danny Elfman started and that title sequence came on, I knew that I was in for something special. And by the time the movie ended, I was a Spider-Man fan for life. It was one of those movie theater experiences that I'll never forget having. But you guys know what the plot of this movie is. It's basically about Peter Parker, who becomes Spider-Man due to a spider bite, and the Green Goblin shows up on the scene, causing trouble in New York City. And it's up to Spider-Man to stop him. A lot of people will argue that it doesn't hold up that well, and people love it because of nostalgia. The nostalgia factor is there, but the characters in the story, they are still very well done. You can call me a Raimi fanboy, but even from an objective standpoint, this movie holds up really well, even today, in my book. What makes Spider-Man such a good movie? Well, well, first of all, let's start with the characters. Peter Parker, played by Tobey Maguire, who's my favorite actor of all time. And Tobey Maguire is a very underrated actor, and the kind of actor that he is very suitable for Peter Parker, because Tobey Maguire's got that face where he looks like a normal guy, and Peter's just like the normal everyday man. Tobey Maguire's got that perfect look, but it's the way he acts around other people. Before he gets bitten by the spider, he's very shy and very timid, and also very intelligent through subtle lines of dialogue with Harry and Norman. Some spiders? change colors to blend into their environment. It's a defense mechanism. Peter, what makes you think I would want to know that? Who wouldn't? It's in these first 10 or 15 or even 20 minutes that you learn a lot about this character, just like, Boom, boom, boom. Here's what you need to know. Boom, boom, boom. It doesn't waste any time trying to explain every single minuscule detail about this character. Some people might say that it's too carbon copy and too copy and paste-like. I disagree. I think Sam Raimi does a really good job, along with David Kep's screenplay. You learn a lot about this character, as well as Mary Jane and Harry Osborn as well, and even Norman Osborn. And even with the actor's performances, you learn a lot about these characters just through like a few lines of dialogue and within like 30 seconds or so of time. That I think it's one of those times where it works. It's very faithful to the character, and it still rings true to what the character has been about since 1962. A nerdy kid from Queens who's bullied by almost everybody around him in his class, not well respected, but still has a kind-hearted soul underneath the exterior. And Tobey Maguire plays it perfectly. There's a sense of warmth and wholesomeness that he brings to the character that you can't really help but like the guy when Maguire's playing him. I think he gets the character dead on, and I don't care that he wasn't a comic book fan before this movie came out. And he also did his research for the character. He read comics while they were making this movie. You don't believe me? Check out this picture right here. Do you need any more proof than that? And it's after the spider bite when he gets bitten. You start to see a change in his demeanor as he starts to discover his powers because before he barely had any confidence to go talk to Mary Jane. But once he starts to see these powers come out of him like when he's ripped and he has the ability to crawl on walls and he catches all the food on the tray which apparently took Maguire 156 tries to get it right. 
That's impressive. You start to see the confidence slowly but surely coming right out of him. But also what I like about this is that while he does get a little bit cocky towards the wrestling match, in this high school fight with Flash Thompson, he doesn't do it on purpose. He does it by accident. When he accidentally shoots the web out of his hand onto the tray and he pulls it and hits Flash Thompson in the back of the head, it was all an accident. And he runs out at the door and Flash chases after him. But it's right before the fight starts happening. Listen to what Peter says right here. I don't want to fight you, Flash. I wouldn't want to fight me neither. He doesn't want to cause harm to anybody, even Flash. It shows that he's still a compassionate person who does care about people, even if he doesn't like them very much. Now, let's talk about Kirsten Dunst's Mary Jane. This is something that a lot of people really, really hate. If you think people hate Tobey Maguire, people despise Kirsten Dunst. A lot of people do anyway. I don't. I actually think she was a really good choice for Mary Jane. Yeah, she's not the Mary Jane from the comics spot on. She's kind of like a combination of Gwen Stacy and Mary Jane combined into one because they didn't know if they were going to have Gwen Stacy later on in the series. And to be honest, I prefer Mary Jane over Gwen Stacy overall because except for Spectacular Spider-Man, I didn't really find Gwen Stacy that interesting of a character. She was fine. She was a good character, but, but she was very sweet and affectionate. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but in comparison to Mary Jane. I think Mary Jane has a, that edge just a little bit more considering her troubled childhood and that she's like the polar opposite of Peter Parker because you know the saying, opposites attract. And she's known as the fun girl that goes out and dates all the cool guys in school. There's elements of that in Kirsten Dunst's performance, even though she still has some of those Gwen Stacy traits where she does show that nice side underneath her when she's not in high school. Especially when Peter and Mary Jane have this conversation when they're in their backyards. I think it's a really nice and tender scene. A lot of people say that the romance between these two is like Edward and Bella in Twilight or Anastasia Steele and Christian Grey from Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Or even yet, I've even seen some people say that Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker is in the same league with Hayden Christensen's Anakin Skywalker. <laughs> Pa-lease. You all know the phrase, still a better love story than Twilight? Well, this romance, Peter and Mary Jane, way better than that crap, especially Fifty Shades of Grey. My god, how can you compare those two couples together and say they're in the same league with each other? Are you serious? I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. And what I like about this romance, they don't get together just instantaneously. They have conversations with each other. They actually talk with each other before Mary Jane realizes that she's in love with Peter. They get to know one another and Peter is the complete opposite of her father and Harry and Flash Thompson that you understand why she falls in love with Peter. There's a moment where Mary Jane is about to tell him her dreams of being an actress, but she stops and he's like, well, what? Come on try me. And she tells him, and he doesn't judge her for it because she's afraid of being judged since she's the popular girl. But Peter's like, really? Oh, that's great. You're awesome in all the school plays. And also when they meet up with each other again on the street, she tries to put on the facade that she's on Broadway, but then she gets yelled at by her boss who works in that diner and Peter can clearly see that she's lying about it. So she opens up her coat and reveals her waitress outfit. Some dream, huh? But he says, that's nothing to be embarrassed about. It'd be really easy for Peter to say, ha ha, you suck. But no, he doesn't judge her. He says, well, you have a job at least and you're saving your money, so it's okay. He doesn't judge her in any form at all. He's kind and gentle with her and he's very supportive of her. So you understand why she falls in love with him. And I've always appreciated that she fell in love with him and not Spider-Man. Yeah, she had that flirtatious, this guy's hot because he keeps saving me and I want to kiss him and all that. But really, it was Peter that she was after. It wasn't Spider-Man that she was after. The upside down kiss, uh, it's a famous scene by now. It's really, um, really, uh, interesting scene. <laughs> uh, let me just say, when I was 12 years old, uh, that had some effects on the puberty. <laughs> but, it, but it's not just that. It was also the music in that scene, which scored by Danny Elfman. It's, it's... It's perfect. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. It's the love theme that he composes in that scene. You can understand why this movie appealed to a wider audience and not just the comic book fans. It's something about that scene overall and certain scenes throughout this movie. You can understand why this movie has resonated for 15 years. It's, it's hard to explain, really. I'm gushing a lot about this movie. I can't help it. And also another character that I like is Harry Osborn, played by James Franco. Watching James Franco as Harry Osborn now, it, it almost seems like a weird choice for him, considering how he's known for his buddy movies with Seth Rogen, like Pineapple Express, The Interview, and even This Is The End. And I always thought James Franco was a really good actor, even though lately he's a really 
really peculiar guy. But the guy's a really good actor, so I'll give credit where it's due. I think he's really good here as Harry Osborn, because when you see him and Peter meet up with each other in the field trip scene, you get the sense that they're good friends, like I said, through a few lines of dialogue. And also when he stands up for Peter against Flash Thompson, who's bullying him during the lecture that the scientist is giving them about the spiders. And it's also a good explanation as to why Harry doesn't seem to have any friends except for Peter, because when he stands up for Peter, Flash gives him a hard time when he's like, Leave him alone. Or what? Or his father will fire your father. <laughs> What's daddy gonna do? Sue me? <laughs> Since Harry comes from a rich family, nobody really respects him. And rich people kind of get scolded because of their money anyway. Oh, you had everything handed to you. You never had to work a day in your life. So I can understand why Harry would be friends with Peter because he is an outsider, but in a completely different way. So yeah, I can understand why certain people wouldn't want to be friends with those two guys. And speaking of daddy, let's talk about Norman Osborn, played by the man himself, Willem Dafoe. I think he is probably one of the best castings of a villain I've ever seen in a movie, ever. Defoe is a great actor. I haven't seen too much of his movies. I've seen him in Inside Man with Denzel Washington. I also saw him in Platoon. You know the famous image where he's on the poster like this, like, Ugh. And of course I recently saw him in um, a movie with Shailene Woodley and Ansel Elgort. What was it called again? I forget. This is a slightly different portrayal of Norman Osborn because I've read the 60s comics and Norman Osborn is very cynical and very level-headed as opposed to Willem Dafoe's portrayal in this movie. I mean, it, that's also present in the spectacular Spider-Man and the 90s show. In this movie, you still have some of that stuff where Norman and Harry's father-son relationship is a strain. Norman doesn't really understand his son very well, but he also respects Peter more when he meets him on the university grounds, you know? I'm something of a scientist myself. Immediately, he grows a respect for Peter because of his interest in science. And I like how he doesn't come off as a villain in this scene when he meets Peter. It's not some cliche like, we're gonna be hero and villain, we're gonna be rivals. No, no, he has a reason to like Peter. But we also learn about his dealings with Oscorp and how he's trying to keep his company afloat. His company, Oscorp Industries, has a lot of defense contracts for the military. And this one contract on performance enhancers has a lot of successful tests except for one, where it involved violence, aggression, and insanity. So Norman Osborn's colleague, Dr. Strom, is suggesting that we cancel the whole thing, saying, no, 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 this is too dangerous. We have to take the whole line back to formula. Back to formula? And because of this, the general that's responsible for this defense contract says, if you don't have a successful human trial within two weeks, your funding is pulled and you're done. So in an act of desperation, Norman decides to do the test on himself despite the protests of Dr. Strom. And there's also this little moment right here where he lays down on the uh, bed thing, whatever, and Dr. Strom puts the metal straps on his abdomen. <sighs> Apparently that was ad libbed by Willem Dafoe. I like those little touches right there. And of course, as predicted, various chemicals are injected into his body. It doesn't go so well and he becomes the Goblin. Now, considering that this is both an origin story for Spider-Man and for the Green Goblin, the Green Goblin's like secondary as opposed to Spider-Man because it is his movie. I also appreciate how they immediately go for the arch nemesis of Spider-Man in this movie because they didn't know if they were gonna come back for a sequel. Whereas today, if this movie were to come out, they probably would have thrown in some secondary villain like say the Vulture, which they're doing obviously for Homecoming, but maybe somebody like Sandman, Mysterio, they would save the, the arch nemesis for a later movie, kind of like, this is the next villain we're doing, which I appreciate. In some ways, they're, they're not half-assing it. They're giving it their all, just in case the sequel doesn't pan out. And to go back to the character of Peter Parker, obviously he grows more confident with his powers, but after the high school fight, you see him discovering his powers, and what I appreciate is how excited he gets about these powers and how much fun he's having with it. Because who wouldn't be excited about being able to climb on the walls or spinning webs out of your hands or jumping on the rooftops and whatnot. And while, yeah, you could argue that he should have been a little bit more shocked by his transformation, it, it still makes a really funny moment where he says, Change? Yeah. Big change. <laughs> I didn't get that until I was much, much older. <laughs> And I gotta say, Tobey Maguire, he is a funny guy. And he's not only good at just drama, but he's also really good at comedy. He should do comedies more often. And when he crawls up the wall, I love it. Dun. 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 And when he's jumping up and down over the building tops, it, 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 the CG looks a little bit like, what? But, but still, it makes you go, yeah, you got it, woo! It's like that moment in Man of Steel where Superman flies o across the globe for the first time over the water, and he's going like this. Oh my god, this is awesome, I'm flying! And speaking of how funny Toby is, I love it when he tries to figure out how to spin his webs. Up, up, and away, web! Shazam! 
Speaking of which, a lot of people have problems with the organic web shooters. I've never had a problem with it personally. I only found out about the mechanical ones when I watched the 90s show. And to be honest, I really don't care if they're mechanical or not, depending on whatever incarnation it is. And I get that it's an important part of his intelligence to show how smart he is and how he was able to create the durable web fluid, but in this movie, and even overall, I think it makes sense, because if he has the powers of a spider, why shouldn't he be able to spin his own webs? And also, it's more realistic, because he's a high school kid, no job, very little money, and his uncle and aunt aren't the richest people in the world, so how exactly would a teenager have the, all the resources to create mechanical web shooters? Maybe you could find a way to explain it, but really, like, how believable could that be? And there's also the question of, like, well, how does a high schooler make a costume of this quality? And in this case, they didn't really have an interest in dedicating a huge amount of screen time explaining how a teenager was able to create something that sophisticated. In this case, I can let it slide because the costume looks straight off the page. I love that costume. It's still my favorite live on screen costume. I like the suit in Civil War, and you know what? I like the suit in Amazing Spider Man 2. It's straight off the page, but I'll get more into that in the Amazing Spider Man 2 review. But the costume that Tobey Maguire wears, fantastic costume. Yeah, the eyes are a little different, admittedly, but I look at that costume and I think, yeah. That's Spider-Man. I don't care how he made it, because movies are unrealistic in some way, so. And look, he, he's, he's got the costume, just roll with it. Who, who gives a crap? And again with the casting, Rosemary Harris and Cliff Robertson as Aunt May and Uncle Ben, these two are fantastic. Similar as I said before with Harry and Peter, you get a good sense that they've been together for a long time and that they love each other and they still remain loyal to each other despite all the hard troubles that they've experienced in their marriage. And Rosemary Harris, perfect Aunt May. Not just from a comic book adaptation standpoint, but for what these films needed, she's perfect as well. And the same thing for Cliff Roberts and his Uncle Ben. Now look, people will complain that it all happens too quickly, but the scene where Uncle Ben dies, makes me cry every time I watch the movie. Now let's talk about the death of Uncle Ben. People will argue that it's not really impactful as something like Martin Sheen's Uncle Ben's death. I'll get more to that in the Amazing Spider-Man 1 review, but in this movie, I think it fits really well because like I said, with a few lines of dialogue, you get a good sense of their father-son relationship. And in the scene where Uncle Ben drops Peter off in front of the library, I like how he doesn't try to yell at him or scream at him or anything because he's concerned about what's going on and he tries to be calm and sincere to Peter saying, look, you're changing. I went through the exact same thing. And of course he says the famous line, with great power comes great responsibility. And it doesn't seem forced or tacked on. It seems absolutely appropriate. Now, what Peter says afterwards, stop pretending to be my father. Yeah, Peter was being a bit of a jerk in that scene. But then again, teenagers act like that sometimes. I acted like that sometimes. I wasn't a big troublemaker or anything, but there are a couple times where I snapped at my parents. It, stuff like that happens. And also, we'll talk about it later, but Peter feels deep regret for what he said to Uncle Ben the last time he saw him properly. So I think in that respect, it's a lot more impactful here. It's since we mentioned the library, this is the scene where Peter goes to the wrestling match to win money to buy a car to impress Mary Jane, which let's talk about that for a second. I've heard some people argue that why is Peter in love with Mary Jane in the first place? And if he thinks that buying a car is going to impress her, she's probably not the kind of girl that you want to get with. Well, first of all, just look at Mary Jane. Seriously, look at her. Wouldn't you be attracted to her in some way? Yeah, I was obviously, but who wouldn't be attracted to her? And a lot of the times people fall for the popular girl in school. So why is that so hard to believe? And speaking as a guy, if there's a girl that you're interested in, you'd naturally want to change something about yourself to make yourself more appealing to that person. In the case of Peter, it's a car. And plus, he's like, what, 17, 18 years old as he's supposed to be in this movie? Yeah, it's a teenage perspective. Of course he's going to try to impress Mary Jane because he's trying to act all cool and everything. It's an innocent choice that he made. I'll address it in the second movie. But it's not like he intended all this bad stuff to happen. It comes from something innocent. And, you know, to be honest, I don't want to talk too much about the Amazing Spider-Man movies yet, but I prefer this way of portraying Peter as a teenager in this movie rather than having him being moody and angsty against everybody. And back to the wrestling scene, the wrestling scene is just so over the top and so insanely outrageous. I love it. Bone saws ready. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Bone Saw. And also, let's bring this up. This is the scene where I first noticed Octavia Spencer, who's now an Oscar winner and famous for movies like The Help, Hidden Figures, which by the way was a really good movie, and she's also got The Shack coming up pretty soon, and she's even in Snowpiercer. How far she has come. Down the hall to the ramp, may God be with you. <laughs> Peter, just be glad she didn't give you a chocolate pie. 
<laughs> I know my Nana's gonna get a kick out of that because she loves that movie. Anyway, and also the costume that Peter wears in this scene. I remember when I first saw this and I was excited to think that it was probably gonna be the costume that he wears eventually in the end. But when I saw that costume, I thought, Oh, no, no. But of course, as an adult, I think it makes more sense because again, how is he gonna be able to make that costume like this? So as a teenager, it looks like it was made by a high schooler. I will say that much. And it also has a cameo from Bruce Campbell, who's famous for the Evil Dead films. And Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell love to collaborate with each other. I like how he makes cameo appearances in these three movies. What's your name, kid? The Human Spider. The Human Spider, that's it? That's the best you got? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. The sum of $3,000 will be paid to the terrifying, the deadly, the amazing Spider-Man. And there's also moments like this. Hey, listen, there's some kind of mistake. I didn't sign up for a cage match. I got you for three minutes. Three minutes of playtime. And also, it has this funny line by Spider-Man. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? <laughs> I love it. And of course, we all know that Peter ends up winning the match, but I always found it really odd that Bonesaw's girlfriends are feeding him the chairs and the crowbars through the cages like, he's cheating, stop. But of course it doesn't matter because he wins. But then when he goes to get the money, the guy refuses to pay him and only gives him a hundred bucks. So Peter storms out, but then the guy gets robbed. And as you know, the thief runs towards Peter and he's given an opportunity to stop him and he doesn't. And I like how Peter gets back at the guy. You could have taken that guy apart. Now he's gonna get away with my money. I missed the part where that's my problem. But of course, you know, that has dire consequences. And the Uncle Ben death scene, again, I remember when I first saw this, I had no idea how Spider-Man becomes a hero. And when you see that it's Uncle Ben lying on the ground, my jaw hit the floor. I was like, <gasps> and then when he dies, oh man, talk about tears. And even now as an adult, it still hits me. It's sad. And then later on, when he hears that Uncle Ben's killer is being pursued by the police, he chases after him in his wrestling costume. And it's actually really, really riveting. And it's really exciting where you're like, yeah, get him, Spider-Man, get him. And he also learns on the fly how to web swing through the city. And this little moment right here where he shoots the web at the wall and he's about to swing, but then he's like, wait a second. Because before, when he tried swinging over the buildings, he crashed into the wall, <laughs> which was a funny moment. So he learns on the fly as he's swinging and he chases after his uncle's killer and he corners him in the warehouse and he sees that it's the same guy that he let go at the arena. Again, at the time, I didn't know anything about how the character becomes Spider-Man or a superhero, but when his face was showing, Peter's reaction, and then the flashbacks, I literally was going like this. Stop it! And when I showed this to my mom a few months after it came out, when it came out on DVD, she had a similar reaction. I remember it very specifically. I was looking at her because, you know, like when you show some of your personal favorite movies to your family or friends and you kind of look at them, seeing how they respond to certain things. That's how I was with this movie because there's a lot of moments in here where I'm like, what'd you think of that? <laughs> And it's the whole reason he's Spider-Man, which also plays into a couple of scenes later where he graduates from high school. He's in his room and he's tearing up a little bit. And a lot of people, from what I heard, hate this scene because he's crying. First of all, he cries twice in this movie. That does not equate to him crying 50 times, okay? And also, hello, he's still feeling guilty over his Uncle Ben's death. And it's his graduation, so his Uncle Ben would have attended that. And Uncle Ben raised him since he was a boy. And he follows it up with the line, I missed him a lot today. And he tried to tell me something important and I shoved it in his face. How can you not like sympathize with this character and the regret and pain and sorrow that he feels? And it's important that they address all that as well because it's the whole reason he's Spider-Man. And I can tell you, my dog died a couple months ago. We had to put him to sleep and it's only been a couple months since he sadly passed away. I love you, buddy. Even now, every once in a while, I still tear up about it. So I can relate to that in a lot of ways. And you know, some people are different at handling their emotions than others, but you don't get over stuff like that. You get through it, but getting over it, no, no, you don't get over that kind of stuff. So I'm fine with him crying here. People have also complained that he looks like he's constipated when he cries. Look, people do not look like models when they cry. They scrunch their faces up and look like a complete mess. What do you expect him to look like, like this? Like he's in a Backstreet Boys music video. <laughs> but it's also in that scene where he finally has that push to become Spider-Man, where he realizes that he can use his powers for good. And if he's not able to save his uncle, he might be able to save other people and save them from the fate that his uncle Ben suffered. As it says in that voiceover, with great power comes great responsibility. 